Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. I love my children, but gosh, they can be annoying. And I know everyone alive can sympathize with this sentiment, whether or not they have children, for the simple reason that the only thing more annoying than your own children are somebody else's. Imagine this scenario, a flight from Toronto to Kansas City, that's four hours, or three episodes of Squid Game, or 160 pages of one of those Twilight series of books. Whatever your recreational occupation of choice, you are ready to prepare for a long spell in that airplane. You get to your seat, and you see that a family has beaten you to it. They took advantage of early boarding for families, and they apologetically moved the diaper bag off of your seat, and you realize that you're in for four hours of screaming bloody murder more horrifying than anything you might have seen on Squid Game. And for good reason. Imagine what airline travel is like for a poor babe in arms. The noises, the smells, being confined into a narrow tube with hundreds of people who are definitely not mommy or daddy. Consider the jostling of turbulence, the dry, thin air, and the terrible feeling of pressure building behind your eardrums. Air travel is a horror show for everyone, but babies have it the worst. I know a friend who used to travel with her little one. After the, travel, after the, the passengers were seated, but before the safety briefing, she would turn around and say to everyone seated around her, Hi, we'd like to apologize in advance for any noise or disturbance our child will call you. Please accept this gift as a token of our appreciation of your patience. And then she'd pass out individually wrapped pairs of earplugs. Japan Airline recently announced a change to its online seating reservation system so that you can see where the young kids will be seated and presumably sit as far away from that cacophony as possible. Because let's face it, kids are annoying. In my experience, as kids grow up, the nature of the annoyance changes. For example, our twins are now four and have entered the age of why. Katerina, it's time to put your socks on. Why, Daddy? Because it's time to go to school. Daddy, why do we go to school? Because you need to learn things with your friends and teachers. Daddy, why do we need to learn things? Because learning makes life better. Daddy, why does learning make life better? Darling, learning gives you more choices and helps you make better decisions. Daddy, why does learning help us make better decisions? Sweetie, because optimal outcomes are more probable with socially constructed knowledge. But Daddy, hasn't that epistemology been shown to be naive by postmodern critiques of structuralism? Why do you insist on a flawed philosophy of education? Because, dear, I said so. And that feeling of exasperation after a juvenile interrogation, that feeling of annoyance that being so small could probe so deep when everyone knows that things are just the way they are, that feeling is something that God feels all the time with us. Job and the Gospel of Mark give us a case in point. I'll start with Mark. If you are reading it cover to cover, you'd notice that this incident with the sons of Zebedee follows immediately after Jesus predicts his death. It's a common pattern in Mark that Jesus predicts his death, and then the disciples say something stupid, and he has to correct them about the true meaning of discipleship. In today's case, the brothers James and John are dreaming about the glory to come when Jesus is king. Probably they imagine Jesus will become a benevolent messianic king who will establish a new era of peace, and they want a piece of that peace. In Matthew's version of the story, their mother prompts them into the childlike stunt that it is. They go to Jesus and ask for anything that he might ask for next. It's a childish request, and only a very immature leader like Herod would have fallen for that trick, which, of course, he did when his stepdaughter of Herodias danced for him in chapter 6. Jesus is no Herod. He's no fool. And you can imagine the disapproving look that he probably had on his face right before he got to the point of James and John. They want to rule with Jesus, or at least they want to sit in the grand court of the new king of Israel. It's telling that Jesus takes their requests somewhat seriously. He asks them whether they are willing to undergo the challenges in store for him. And when they apply affirmatively, he takes them at their word. But at the end of the day, not even Jesus knows who will sit with him in glory. And the rest of the disciples are jealous, probably because they didn't think of asking first. And so Jesus has to pull his kids together and give them a talking to about the nature of servant leadership. No doubt he was frustrated. I mean, he had just told them that he was going to get killed, and they want to know whether they could have ice cream after supper. 
but like any good parent, he pushes that feeling down, gets on one knee, and coaches the kids like a holy Ted Lasso. Look, he says, you know what bossy bosses are like. Don't be that guy. Be better. Be the guy that helps everyone else like I do. And that seems so obvious to us, because we know these lessons, we've heard them since we were little kids. But the truth is that we are always forgetting, always falling back into patterns of domination and competition and jostling for position. We are the disciples, and we need to be in school just like Katerina, so that we can make better choices, right? Now consider the book of Job. Here is a man who made all the right choices, and yet still suffers. He loses all his money and stuff, his children die tragically, and his body is afflicted with gross, painful blisters. Compounding his agony is an unsympathetic spouse whose best advice is curse God and die. And his so-called friends, whose idea of consolation is debating about whether he's got any reason to complain. It kind of reminds me of well-meaning people who tell chronically ill folks how they could cure their diseases if they just drank the right kind of organic dragonflower tea and did more yoga. Anyway, they go through three rounds of debate about whether Job is responsible for his ill fate. Surely he must have done something wrong. There must have been some bad choice that he made in his past to lead to this outcome. And isn't that a comforting thought? To believe that we are in charge of our own destinies. That everything not only happens for a reason, but that they are just one link in an unbroken chain of causation that we have forged through virtue and vice. If only we went to school somewhere so that we could know enough about the way the world works that we could make the right choices and have good outcomes. Of course, Job is having none of this, and insists that he is not the cause of his own suffering. He whines and complains and insists that if he could just sue God, that is, if he could take God to court, he would be vindicated. He could prove his case. In today's chapter, we finally get a response from God. Exasperated, the Almighty Father lets loose a cosmic because I told you so, to his annoying kid. Because I said so, the world stands and the stars sing. Because I said so, the lightning flashes and the rains come. Because I said so, the lion eats and the raven flies. If Joe's big question throughout this book has been, Where are you, God? The answer back is, Where was I? Where were you when the world began? It's grand in cosmic poetry and firmly puts all creation in its place. Of course, the lectionary skips the images of God as a midwife giving birth to creation out of the womb of the cosmos, but this is a perfect rebuttal to Job's death wish that he had never been born. Job says, cover me in darkness, and God replies, who is it that darkens counsel? Let there be light. And it was so, a stunning ode to the power and majesty of creation. But it doesn't really answer Job's question. God doesn't explain why Job suffers. In fact, God answers the question with questions, 62 of them in chapter 38 and 40 together. And that's an impressive move of kung fu parenting right there, to take your kid's whining and turn it into a solid, teachable moment. But what's being taught here? What's the lesson? The smartest woman I ever knew was named Marilyn Adams, Dr. Marilyn Adams. When she passed away tragically from pancreatic cancer, she held the same chair at Oxford that Isaac Newton once held. She was a philosopher and a theologian and a fine preacher and priest. She dedicated her life to the problem of evil. If God is good and God is great, why do bad things happen? If God can do anything, why doesn't God eliminate evil from the world? She was never able to answer that question, but she did give some shape to it. So, two ideas that she taught me. One is that the existence of evil may be a necessary byproduct of free will. That is, God restrains God's self from acting in the world in order that we can have meaningful choice. It's like a parent letting go of a bike when a kid is pedaling, full of the knowledge that they well might fall. Another thing to consider is that the question itself might be invalid, like trying to divide a number by zero. It may be logically incoherent to even ask this question. Marilyn Adams used to like to say that we need to understand that God is very, very, very big, and we are very, very, very small. And the only thing that can bridge that size difference is the word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So then the response to suffering, God's answer to the problem of evil, is found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And what we see there is not some clever bit of logic. 
an answer that cuts off any further interrogation like, because I said so. Nah. I think when we look to Jesus, we actually see something that looks more like more questions. Questions like, who is my neighbor? And, will you be healed? And, who is this man? And no matter how annoying it might be to keep pestering our parent God with such questions, my prayer for each of you is that you would keep asking them with the persistence of a four-year-old child. Amen.